from a lethal eye drop poisoning. There was only one poison in Ms. Hernan's toxicology, and it was eye drops, and they weren't on the scene. To an antifreeze annihilation. The harassment, antifreeze poisoning, the lack of calling a doctor when she was dying. It was a painful death, and it was all caused by Mr. Jensen and an alleged fentanyl cocktail overdose murder. And also to say it's accidental, uh, one or two pills might be accidental. 20 or five times the lethal dose is not accidental, Your Honor. That is, a, that, that is someone who, who wants Eric dead. And the person who benefited the most from Eric being dead is the defendant. Several deadly poisonings swept across true crime headlines this year, and we're recapping those cases. We begin in Kenosha County, Wisconsin. This antifreeze poisoning case initially dates back to 1998. It's the trial of Mark Jensen. We, the jury, find the defendant, Mark D. Jensen, guilty of intentional homicide of the first degree as charged in the information. Earlier this year, Mark Jensen was retried and convicted for the death of his wife, Julie Jensen. Julie Jensen was found inside our Wisconsin home back in the late 90s. She was poisoned with ethylene glycol, a key ingredient for antifreeze. So we know about December 1st, we know that's the day that Julie goes to Dr. Borman, and we know that that's the day the defendant gives her the first dose of ethylene glycol because by the early morning hours of December 2nd, she is showing the symptoms of ethylene glycol intoxication. She's acting drunk. That's the first stage of ethylene glycol poisoning. And so what happens when Julie is acting drunk in those early morning hours? 4.35 a.m., we have the search for paroxetine. Paxil, that's the antidepressant. And so this time, this is when the defendant goes on the internet and he looks up this website for paroxetine Paxil and he shows it to Julie and he shows her all those side effects, a ton of side effects, as a way to soothe her worries because she doesn't know why she's acting like this, why she's feeling like this, but she went to the doctor and she got that medicine and so now there's an excuse. This doctor visit was very important to the defendant. Julie was scared. She wasn't just going to drink or eat what the defendant gave her, particularly when he was trying to force it on her, just like with the wine. But what if instead of force, he used deception, something he's very well practiced in? What if he behaved how Julie wanted him to behave all along? What if he acted like he cared? What if he acted like he was concerned? What if he was good to her? He's making sure she's taking her new medication, something to drink along with it, and when she starts feeling these strange effects, he has something to blame it on, something he can show her on the Internet, something to soothe her. It would take more than two decades for Julie Jensen's murder to be brought to justice. Her husband and subsequent killer Mark Jensen's first trial ended in his conviction. However, the verdict was overturned after the Wisconsin Supreme Court ruled jurors should not have heard about a letter Julie Jensen wrote known as the Beyond the Grave letter. The letter was written to police and stated should anything happen to her, Julie's husband Mark should be law enforcement's first suspect. During Jensen's retrial, prosecutors showed evidence of Jensen's motive and means to kill his wife including witnesses who testified about incriminating statements made by Jensen prior to his wife's death. One of the star witnesses, a man named Edward Klug. Now, thinking back to this conversation that you had with Mark Jensen, um, can you tell us, to the best of your recollection, what Mark Jensen said to you? <sighs> Mark was talking about how, how to get rid of the problem, basically. Um, you know, the websites that you could go to, uh, to search how to kill your wife. And it was just like the craziest thing that I ever heard that, you know, an educated person would say something like that. Um, and then he was talking about poisons and Benadryl and, uh, you know, things that could be undetectable. So um, the problem 
what was the problem that Mark Jensen had in his life when he, he was saying these things to you? Well, the problem was he didn't want to uh, pay maintenance. He, you know, wanted to have everything and have his new friend, Kelly, move in with him. And so the problem was his wife? That's correct. Now, at this point, you had described that Mark Jensen had been drinking. Yes. Um, did you have any opinion on whether he was intoxicated or not? Um, you know, it, it, it's, I know he w had been drinking. It was just, I couldn't believe somebody was talking like that. I mean, it was, um, I had never heard anybody talk like that. It was really weird. So you would say that he was drinking, but um, do you know if he was intoxicated or not, based on your observations? You know, to say if somebody was intoxicated, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I don't think he was stumbling all over. I mean, he was, you know, definitely animated in the fact that he was telling you how to kill his wife. Okay, and so what do you remember him mentioning in terms of the kinds of things he was looking up? Sure. Um, he was looking up poison. Um, and he was telling me that you could get items that would be non-detectable in a normal autopsy. Um, he was looking at um, ways that, you know, he would put somebody to sleep, you know, and, and put something in. He said you could put it in drinks, have them, uh, have them drink it. Um, and did he, did he mention any other substances? Um, well, he was talking about um, Benadryl and Benadryl and, and uh, like what I look at, he, he, sa he said like ethylene glycol and I didn't know what ethylene glycol was um, and then it's the antifreeze. Um, so I kept looking at Benadryl and saying, well, what, what's in Benadryl? You know, and, then, and I looked up the base chemical, it's polyethylene glycol, which is not toxic to you. So I couldn't understand how Benadryl would kill you. Um, but you recall him mentioning then ethylene glycol? Yes, I remember ethylene glycol. And then you learned that that's antifreeze? Yes. Okay, and you've described this as a, a crazy conversation? Yes. Um, and so at some point um, after this conversation has occurred, at some point, do you leave the conversation? Yeah, because it was getting late, um, and I always like to check in with my my wife, so she because she would be up, she's worried about me, and you know, so I would I would go, I went back to the room and and, and called her, called Joanne. All right. So did you actually speak to your wife on the phone? Yes, I did. And even though it's really late at night. Yes. Yeah. Because I, you know, I would always check in with her and and then you know I I had to tell her what kind of crazy conversation I was having. Another key witness for the state, Mark Jensen's second wife, Kelly Brooks. She moved in with Mark not too long after Julie Jensen's death and the two married just a few years later. You appear to be inquiring what he is going to do about his details. Correct? Yes. Um, and so the big issue being he's married. Right and he's not giving you a response on what he's going to do. Right. Okay, so then how does he respond to that? Murphy spins on details. Details are just noise in the bigger picture, and yep, disgusting. Okay, and so now you continue to ask. And you plan on dealing with the details how? What kind of disgusting? He replies. One at a time. You reply. Evasive little shit. He wasn't answering your questions? Right. Okay, then what does he say to that? Ooh, she went to lunch and came back nasty. Not trying to be evasive, what exactly are you looking for? We can talk about the details, smile, you're cute when you smile, and other things. You reply? I didn't come back nasty, I'm usually like this. Okay, we'll discuss the details. I'm cute when I smile. Not trying to suck up, are you? Okay, then he says? Okay, you're cute when you try to burp. And you say? Nice way to avoid the subject. You're worse than me. Okay, so your impression still is he's not answering your question. Right. What he's going to do about his details. Okay, and so his reply to that? Okay, ask me about a detail. I'm not avoiding, you're not asking. I'm supposed to guess the question. Okay, I'll be Karnak. Okay, your reply? 
You asked me if I wanted to run off with you somewhere. I'd love to, but there are issues we have to deal with. I'm not sure how I'll deal with my issue, thus the deadlines and agreements for any backing out that might be necessary. Do you know how you'll deal with your issues, details, whatever? Okay. Um, and so at this point in time, mid-October of 1998, you were not yet sure that you wanted to divorce your husband. Right. Okay. And so that's why you don't want to make a firm commitment at this time. Right. And you set a deadline for yourself and for the defendant of the end of the year. Right. Okay. And so what is his reply? Are deadlines and agreement necessary? Not trying to pin anything down. And I got my ticket punched. Had that conversation, heard the answers. We're just hanging out for lack of one of us making a decision. Just need to decide what to do or make an announcement. What did you understand him to be saying there? Um, it sounded like he had talked to his wife and by him getting his ticket punched that she probably said she wasn't in love with him anymore and that they were just staying together for convenience at this point. So you believe he's talking about his relationship with his wife? Yes. Jensen was ultimately convicted again for his wife's murder. State of Wisconsin versus Mark D. Jensen, 2002 CF 314 verdict. We, the jury, find a defendant, Mark D. Jensen, guilty of intentional homicide of the first degree as charged in the information. Dated this first day of February 2023, signed by the four person. Prior to his sentencing, Jensen pleaded with the judge to let him out on parole since he had already served 20 years in prison. My parents are 87 and 85 and they need my help. I want to be there to help them and to be able to spend time together while we are able. I have a special relationship with each of the three boys and love them dearly. They lost their mom and me during very important years of their lives. David and Doug lost both parents and Andy lost his dad. All three have been through an incredible ordeal over the past 25 years. They each struggled to find their own way, each doing what they needed to do to survive this on their own. It's taken a toll on them. They deserve my help if they want it. I want to be there for them, help them accept the verdict and help them heal. I know that Doug has expressed anger with me in his current letter to the court. If at any time he wants my hope or wants to talk to me, I will be there for him in his time. David and Doug were young when Julie died and their memories have faded. I'm hoping the time together with, will help them heal and allow me to help keep family memories alive in a way that a phone call never can. During the time I raised Doug and David on my own, I remember spending time with each of them doing things they loved. David and I would go fishing. We built fishing rods together. We played video games. Doug and I went golfing together and we fished together. We spent entire summers together. Doug was also accompanying me to job sites and helping me during the summer. The three of us would go fishing and camp together all summer. Those memories with the boys are some of the happiest times of my life. When I went to prison, Doug was lost. He was sending me letters that Dodge saying that he was struggling without me. I later learned that Doug began cutting himself when he was about 13 years old. I didn't learn that till years afterwards, but I had just gotten to Dodge when this happened. While in prison, I made every effort to continue to be there for my sons. I have always tried to be there in any way I could while serving my prison time. Doug is hurting. I can tell that from the letter he wrote to the court. I wish I could take that hurt away, but I can't. I love Doug with all my heart. It breaks my heart. It breaks my heart to see him hurting like this. If the court grants me parole, I will be there for Doug if he wants me to be there for him. If he doesn't want a relationship with me, I will respect that. I will always be there for him, whether in custody or out of custody, if his feelings change. But the judge wasn't moved by his words and ordered Jensen to spend the rest of his life behind bars. But what about Julie? 
she has nothing today. She's dead. She's never going to see her children get married, have successful lives, be there for the holidays. Um, he caused that. He's the one that put that in motion. He says, well, now my boys don't have two parents. Well, guess what? He's the one that murdered Julie. And the evidence showed that through the trial, she did not have a good life for a period of time that she was married to Mr. Jensen. The harassment, the uh, antifreeze poisoning, the lack of calling a doctor when she was dying, it was a painful death and it was all caused by Mr. Jensen. You know, I, I look at the pictures that I have in front of me, they're pictures of Mr. Jensen with his children, but I still remember Julie Jensen's picture that we had during a trial. She was a loving mother. She loved her children. Both sides agreed to that. And she will never get to see her children grow up because she was murdered by the defendant. So this was planned out for a long time. It was intentional. It was researched with a purpose for evil. He's not getting any parole elig eligibility. It's too serious of a crime to depreciate. It was too vengeful. I have to, to consider the uh, need to protect the public from any further criminal activity based on all the factors I just put into the record. <clears throat> no parole, life imprisonment. That is the judgment of the court. He can do the rights of appeal in the back. Next, we have another case, also in Wisconsin, where a woman was recently convicted of fatally poisoning her friend's water with eye drops and stealing nearly $300,000 from her. We know that the defendant, Ms. Kraszewski, killed Lynn Hernan again because eventually, after her story changes a number of times, she admits to detectives that she knowingly gave Lynn Hernan a bottle filled with Visine and as you can see, Visine has tetrahydrosaline. They're not synonymous, but when we talk about tetrahydrosaline in this case, we're oftentimes talking about Visine. Again, defendant had the intent to kill Lynn Hernan. This is, again, taken directly from the jury instruction as to what intent means. And there it is again. After admitting that she gave this bottle laced with Visine to Lynn Hernan, she told detectives she knew it could very well kill Lynn. She still left, went shopping, opened other credit cards in Lynn's name while Lynn was dying of poisoning. A jury found 39-year-old Jesse Kerchevsky guilty of first-degree intentional homicide and two counts of theft in connection to the death of Lynn Hernan. Hernan was found dead inside her home in 2018 with crushed medication on her chest. Her friend Jesse called the police to report her death. She told investigators there was a possibility Hernan was suicidal. I, you know, when I talked to the medical examiner last, uh, um, well, I talked to him numerous times. The first couple times, they said there was a few issues as far as health-wise. She had, like, five things. Uh -huh. Then they said they were weighing on toxicology. Uh -huh. And then they said um, they sent out second samples or tissues or something, and then they stopped saying anything. And they said I had to contact you guys. And that's when I got the so, boss. Okay. <laughs> and I'm oh. going, I just want to know, like, because they kind of, like, weren't sure we didn't know if it was a suicide or if it was something medical. She was in the hospital shortly before. She'd been sick for years. We really weren't sure, you know, if this is something because the doctors could never figure out what was going on. Mm -hmm. So it was frustrating, and she had literally probably 10 boxes of medical documents. Okay. And, you know, we just didn't know. And, I mean, I know what state she was in and where she was at, but I didn't. You know, it's kind of frustrating because I was there all the time taking care of her. I'm the one who took her to the doctor. I'm the one who did everything. So the not knowing, you know, and I wasn't there with her. There is a medical So issue it bothers me because I go, could I have been there? Could I have helped? Could I have done something? You know, that's my hardest part. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've never found anybody before, and it's not something I ever want to do again. So, um, The medical examiner 
They're very thorough. Yeah. I barely graduated high school. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And they're super smart. When they talk to me sometimes, oh, I'm yeah. like, hey, hey, hey. Well, you got to figure that out a little well, bit. Well, that's when they were talking to me. I'm going, I don't know what that means. I'm sorry. I don't understand. You know? <laughs> so. So, um, at this point, I mean, they're waiting for their, their secondary, their, they call them confirming tests. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but there doesn't appear, there's no trauma to the body. Nothing like that. She had medical issues, yeah. which I think is pretty well documented with the medical <laughs> record. Yeah. Well, I want to know. That's what I want to know. If it's in her head, if this has been five years worth in her head, it's frustrating that the doctors could never find anything. You uh-huh. know, and, I mean, they found little things, but not. She, she just kept she doing repeat checks for years. three months. I mean, she had like bullets two points a week. Yeah. And she had such stomach issues, and she was just frustrated. And finally, the last time we went in. Which was four days before she passed, uh-huh. that she was she got out. She was in for two weeks, and. And where'd she go, Waukesha? Um, no. Pro Healthcare Waukesha. Waukesha Memorial yeah. here, right just up the road. Um. The hospital right up the road. Or was she in the clinic or the hospital? No, she was admitted to the ER, and then they. Oh, um, but it was it was Pro Healthcare. It was right here, I think. I thought it was walkie shots. This is walkie Yeah, it's pro-healthcare. It's pro-healthcare. It's Yeah, I know actually it's close to here because there was like the same accident. Investigators later determined that was all a ruse, and Karchevsky later admitted to police she brought the bottle to Pernin loaded with six bottles worth of Visine. I'm going to tell you, this is your last opportunity because if to start later on, you decide you want to talk, you want to, you want to tell us the last 5%. This is the chance because, again, we, talk, we talked about appearances and how it looks later on when it's this and it's that and it's changed. This is it. This is the time to talk about that last 5% that we need to know because later on, again, it's going to look different. Okay? So is there anything else that you want to tell us? Is there anything else about that scene? about that morning. I can honestly say I did not crush those pills that day for her. I left with the plate of pills that she was supposed to take. That I can say. You I knew that not... morning when this was her plan. She knew her talk about it. So I don't want to say I knew it was her plan because it's been her plan. Mm-hmm. So I mean, 100%. I, 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 it I did not think I was going to come to find her like this. She was she pulling stuff out like this for a reason, and you knew it. She's been pulling that out, though, because when we went to the hospital, she had that with us. Because that was for the hospital. I mean, there are other stuff that she pulled yeah. out. Did she know? She always did. She always said, this is where okay. this is, this is where this is. Make sure. She told me that for the last six months, where all her stuff is to know and have ready and... My boss um, is going to knock on the door here real quick because we had two, bo- two dead bodies in two or three days. He wants this done a half hour yeah. ago. you got to lay it out. Yeah. That morning you talked, she, you knew what her plan was. Yeah. I've known it for months. And when you gave her that bottle, you were sick inside. I was sick inside, but I didn't that think I'd find her. This was kind of going to happen. Because I, she was a good possibility this was going to happen. Yes. Because she was done. Yeah. And you knew that. But I, I can honestly say I did not know I would and have. And it was the, you the you personal representative around the That list. afternoon, you was still spinning in your head that you thought, I'm going to go back there, she might be dead. And you couldn't tell him because no. he's too good of a person. <laughs> no. And you feel horrible. But you feel horrible about all this. Her last will at the house has Anthony and my mom on it. The last will that was at the house, just so you guys know, because you probably found it. Mm-hmm. It was there. I, I did not know that. I want that no. My mom knew from too. Day one that she so. her, you tried to help her. She she was done. She was in such pain and such misery, and you did what you thought was right. It's that simple. You did what you thought was right. Is that correct? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And you feel horrible about it. I don't even want to say it was right. I did what she wanted because she wanted it. But you resisted a bunch of times oh, before, and then she wore you down, and this time this was it. If she, I would have thought this was right, I wouldn't have pulled the trigger and just shot her. You can't do that. You're not that person. During Kerchevsky's trial, the medical examiner rejected the defense's theory that Hernan's death was a suicide, confirming she died from tetrahydrazoline poisoning. Was there any discussion or diagnoses in the medical records you reviewed that Ms. Hernan had any kind of a terminal illness? No. Was there any record that suggested Ms. Hernan needed to be moved to or think about hospice care? No. In terms of 
being two weeks in bed when you testified to that, where, what location was Ms. Hernan in bed for two weeks? In the hospital. Okay. Again, this is the last page of Exhibit 210, is that right? Is that true, Doctor? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. So in terms of Exhibit 210 and the way that you've summarized your review of records in this case, at any point did you see concerns by any provider that Ms. Hernan had suicidal ideations? No. Severe depression? No. Terminal illness? No. Can you kind of walk through that line for the jury and explain what the imports, importance is of each box? Okay, so tetrahydrazoline is the name of the compound. It does have a CNS effect, if, actually, not only if used orally, but if you use too much in your nose or your mouth, you might have some CNS effects. So it's not just orally, but it's not supposed to be taken orally. And so it's not for oral use. It does have a CNS effect. It's over the counter. Her blood level was 160 nanograms per ml. The liver level was 1,300 nanograms per gram. The gastric was 7,100 nanograms per ml. There were no fragments. It's a liquid, so that it wasn't on the body, and it wasn't at the scene. So there was no empty eyedrop bottles or full eyedrop bottles at the scene anywhere. Why was it important for you to know whether these compounds have a CNS depressant effect? Because they can be additive. You know, if you take a couple, of, and we talked about that when we looked at the medical records with the concern about alprazolam and hydrocodone, and then if you add a bunch of more things that affect your CNS, that can be additive, which is also reflected in how I signed the death certificate. Karchevsky sobbed uncontrollably when the verdict was read sealing her fate as a convicted killer. We, the jury, find the defendant, Jesse R. Kershevsky, guilty of first-degree intentional homicide as charged in count one of the information. Signed by the four-person, juror number 24, and dated today's date, the 14th of November, 2023. We, the jury, find the defendant, Jesse R. Kershevsky, guilty of theft of movable property as charged in count two of the information, signed and dated by the four-person, juror number 24, this 14th day of November, 2023. As to the special verdict questions, if you find the defendant guilty, answer the following question. Was the property stolen more than $100,000? Answer, no. Was the property stolen more than $10,000? Answer, yes. No other amounts were answered. We, the jury, find the defendant, Jesse R. Kershevsky, guilty of theft of movable property as charged in count three of the information, signed by the four-person dated today's date, the 14th day of November, 2023. Was the property stolen more than $100,000? Answer, no. Was the property stolen more than $10,000? Answer, yes. No other special verdicts uh, questions answered. Next up is a case thousands of miles away in the Beehive State, where a Utah woman is accused of fatally poisoning her husband with fentanyl, disguising the drug as a cocktail. And also to say it's accidental, uh, one or two pills might be accidental. 20 or five times the lethal dose is not accidental, Your Honor. That is, a, that, that is someone who, who wants Eric dead. And the person who benefited the most from Eric being dead is the defendant. This case has motive that she uh, needed to get out of this debt, and that's the reason she killed Eric in hopes of getting his estate, in hopes of getting his, his life insurance policies. And that's and that, Your Honor, we believe is substantial evidence. Corey Richens faces murder and drug charges for allegedly poisoning her husband, Eric Richens, with an overdose of fentanyl given to him in a Moscow mule. Eric Richens was found dead at the foot of the couple's bed last March. A year later, Corey published a children's book titled Are You With Me? A story about navigating grief after the loss of a loved one. According to investigators, Corey Richens allegedly bought the drugs from an acquaintance of hers. That person has only been identified by the initial CL. 
I'm going to now ask you, detective, some questions about someone with the initial CL. Do you know who I'm talking about when I say CL? Yes, I do. Who is CL in relation to the defendant? CL is an associate of the defendant. Uh, she cleaned houses for the defendant's business as well as her personal home at times. Does CL have a criminal drug history? Yes. Is she under supervision in a different county, a county other than Summit County? Yes, she is. And is that in relation to certain drug charges? Yes. Did CL cooperate with being interviewed? Yes, she did. Did CL know Eric Richens? Yes, CL told us that during the time that she spent cleaning the Richens home, she got to know Eric, that she felt that he was a really good person, she liked him, and she was very saddened to hear that he had passed away. Did there come a time when investigators executed a search warrant on CL's home? Yes. In executing that warrant, did you make any observations consistent with CL's testimony that she felt bad about Eric Richens' death? Yes. Inside the home, we identified a bedroom that belonged to CL. In the bedroom, there was a mirror above a desk. Uh, on the mirror were taped or fixed several inspirational quotes uh, that seemed to relate to her recovery and her drug court program. Amongst all those uh, inspirational quotes was a newspaper clipping of Eric Richens' obituary. Did you get the impression that part of the reason CL cooperated is because she felt bad for Eric Richens? Yes, in fact, she said so many times in our interviews. CL told detectives sometime between December 2021 and February 2022, Corey Richens contacted her asking for prescription pain pills. CL reportedly obtained hydrocodone and left the pills at a home Corey was flipping, picking up the cash left for them. But a few weeks later, Corey Richens reached out again asking for, quote, the Michael Jackson stuff. Corey allegedly then went to CL's house and paid nearly $1,000 for 15 to 30 fentanyl pills that CL obtained from a dealer. Eric Richens was found unresponsive on March 4, 2022, less than a week after this alleged pill delivery. His wife was arrested more than a year later in May of 2023 and denies she's behind Eric's death. Since her headline making arrests, several bombshell accusations have flown out in court, from her trying to steal her late husband's money. Her behavior gives me great concern, as she has exploited the boys for money and will likely do so again. In addition, Corey has weaponized Eric's children, manipulating my dad to do or not do things by threatening to come in to cut him out of their lives if he did, if he did not capitulate to her demands. She similarly deprived the boys of contact with myself, my sister, and her daughters unless we agreed to give her the money in Eric's trust, money that Eric wanted to go to his three children. As if that were not enough, I have been told that Corey started telling their three little boys that none of Eric's family or friends loved them. She apparently told them none of us cared for them or wanted to be around them, even though that is the exact opposite of what was happening. We all want nothing more than to be there for those three little boys, my nephews, yet Corey has made sure to cut us out of every aspect of their lives. This is all just a brief summary and the start of what our family has been through over the last year. We have scarcely gone a day without finding out some new allegations or evidence regarding something Corey appears to have maliciously done to attack and undermine my brother, his three little boys, and our family. We have all been there since the beginning of Corey's and Eric's relationship. I was there on one of their first dates. We were there at the wedding. We were there when each of the boys were born. We have been there for every birthday party, school graduation, and rodeo. We welcomed her into our family and treated her as one of us. Not only did she betray our brother, it feels as though she has murdered and taken away a part of our souls as well. Because of her actions, there has not been a day that has gone by we have not lived with paralyzing anxiety and fear, worrying for the boys' lives as well as our own. I may be naive, but I never knew evil like this existed.
to accusations of witness tampering stemming from a six-page letter infamously known as the Walk the Dog letter, which according to the state contained instructions for Corey Richens' brother to lie when testifying and say Eric Richens purchased pain pills and fentanyl in Mexico. However, her defense team maintained the letter was a work of fiction about her stay at a Mexican jail. Despite defense motions to toss the case out, a judge ruled the Richens trial will move forward. Now we head to North Dakota, where a woman allegedly had a $30 million reason for fatally poisoning her boyfriend. 47-year-old Ina Kanoyer was arrested and charged in late October with killing her boyfriend of a decade, Stephen Riley Jr., with antifreeze. Court records revealed the motive behind the heinous plot. Ina allegedly poisoned her longtime boyfriend after learning he was planning to break up with her when he received an inheritance of $30 million. According to court records, Ina told investigators she was entitled to part of that large sum because she was Stephen's common law wife. The problem is North Dakota does not recognize common law marriages. And according to police, Ina became incensed when investigators explained that little detail to her. Court documents go on to state the shocking details surrounding Stephen Riley's death. Stephen was found unresponsive in the couple's home on September 4th. He was rushed to a local emergency room, but his condition was so severe he had to be flown to a Bismarck hospital where he passed away the next day. Investigators say shortly after Stephen's death, loved ones of his shared their concerns that Ina was behind it. They explained to police Ina made comments in the past about poisoning him with antifreeze. Even making comments after his death that he was poisoned with antifreeze despite no lab work tests for antifreeze being completed, and no medical professionals conveying any information about Stephen's condition to Ina, including the fact that he died. Stephen's friends also revealed to police that the day prior to his hospitalization, one friend witnessed Ina throwing Stephen's belongings outside on the afternoon of September 3rd. Then that evening, friends say they quickly noticed Stephen's health declining. According to court documents, Stephen sounded the alarm on what would become his untimely death. He told friends he felt like he was drunk, but didn't consume alcohol. He had stomach pain, was unsteady on his feet, and nearly fell over trying to walk. While friends wanted to rush him to the ER earlier, Ina was reportedly adamant that her boyfriend was suffering from a heat stroke and just needed rest. After Stephen's passing, court documents reveal the coroner was made aware of the antifreeze poisoning concerns and conducted a test on Stephen's blood. The results showed ethylene glycol in his system, a key ingredient for antifreeze, noting his cause of death as ethylene glycol poisoning. Once police executed a search warrant for the couple's home, in the living room they discovered an old Windex bottle with a cap containing bright green liquid suspected to be antifreeze. In the garage, police also found a glass Coors Light bottle and a plastic mug, both containing the suspected poison. But Ina reportedly told investigators what she believed happened, including a scenario where Stephen's cigarette may have fallen into the antifreeze in the garage. She even claimed to Google symptoms of heat stroke and claimed they mimicked poisoning and also admitted to serving sweet tea to her boyfriend throughout the day. The affidavit points out antifreeze is known to be easily disguised in sweet drinks. Ina was arrested on October 30th, about a month after Stephen passed away. Our final case brings us back east toward Minnesota, where a former Mayo Clinic resident and poison control specialist remains behind bars for allegedly poisoning his wife with medicine used to treat gout. Authorities arrested 30-year-old Connor Bowman in October for the death of his wife, Betty Bowman. The two married in 2021. She worked as a pharmacist while her husband was completing his medical residency. Then, just two years later, Betty was dead. According to court documents, Betty Bowman was admitted into a Rochester, Minnesota hospital on August 16th, where she suffered from gastrointestinal distress and dehydration. Her condition quickly worsened. Investigators say the medical examiner's report noted Betty's initial symptoms were similar to food poisoning, which the doctors treated as such. But then her condition just kept getting worse. She reportedly experienced cardiac issues, fluid in her lungs, part of her colon had to be removed, and she eventually died from organ failure, just days after being admitted into the hospital. Connor's criminal complaint states he suggested Betty was suffering from a rare illness known as HLH. Earlier, we spoke with Dr. Mary Jumbelic, the former chief medical examiner of Onondaga County. She said Connor may have suggested HLH as Betty's cause of death because it's difficult to diagnose. And what's even more disturbing, Connor reportedly tried to stop his wife's autopsy, arguing to the medical examiner that Betty's death was natural and she should have been cremated immediately. 
He also allegedly asked the medical examiner via email if the toxicology analysis in the autopsy would be more thorough than the one from the hospital. And he kept trying to cover his tracks. Investigators say they received a report that Connor got access to Betty's patient account through hospital credentials. He allegedly looked at admission information, notes, medication, and an operating room log. At one point, he placed himself on Betty's care team, which allowed him access to her medical records without having to enter credentials. And it doesn't end there. According to the complaint, detectives got a search warrant for Connor's laptop, which was issued by the University of Kansas, where he worked as a poison specialist. A woman from the university later notified detectives in late September that Connor used the university-issued device in the days before Betty's death to search for information on colchicine, a drug used to treat gout, and sodium nitrate. The complaint states Connor used an online tool to convert Betty's weight to milligrams, then multiplied that number by 0.8 milligrams, which is the lethal dosage rate of colchicine. According to Dr. Jumbelic, once the drug was in Betty's system, she had a short time frame before the effects would have magnified. It has a really narrow therapeutic index, and what that means is a little bit of it's okay to treat gout on a regular basis, but a little bit more than that, and you can. Uh, suffer a poisoning. It might not be fatal, but you might get very sick and need support at the hospital. So uh, it would have an acute presentation when too much of it is given, and it doesn't take a lot. So how did Connor allegedly commit the unthinkable? After Betty's death, friends of the couple told investigators the two were having marital issues. It was later revealed through court documents the two were in an open relationship, but things soured when Connor is said to have developed an emotional attachment to a woman that was not his wife. One friend reported to police that Betty learned Connor had a significant amount of debt that he was trying to hide from Betty. That same friend reported to police Connor had not shown any grief after Betty's death and even invited friends out to drinks just two days after she died. One friend told police she saw Betty less than a week before she was taken to the hospital. Betty asked her to try a smoothie Connor made and quickly noticed a bad taste that was described as, quote, bitter and salty. Nothing like a smoothie would be expected to taste. Betty's friend even joked with her, Connor must be trying to poison her. According to the search warrant applications, a friend of Connor's from the Mayo Clinic told police Connor received a half a million dollars in life insurance for Betty's death and also told police the fact that Connor was a pharmacist with a history of working in poison control was concerning because Connor would have knowledge about hazardous substances and would know what would be screened for an autopsy. Betty's death was ultimately ruled as a homicide on October 20th, nearly two months after Betty was first admitted into the hospital. Connor was arrested that same day and charged with second degree murder in his wife's death. He remains behind bars on a conditional $2 million bail. As some of these cases continue to unfold, the Long Crime Network team will keep you updated along the way. From trial hearings to unsealed court documents and everything else in between, we have you covered. Reporting for Long Crime Network, I'm Elizabeth Milner.